It's question show time. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are, anywhere across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down on any video and I will answer it here. I just want to remind everybody that uh, the coolest thing that I think I do, apart from these videos, is my weekly email newsletter. I mention it at the end of every of the regular Guide to Space episodes, but for those of you who just skip over that, Every week, uh, it's a big, long email newsletter that I write that has pictures, links. I write every word in it. There's no ads. Uh, if you're into space news, I think you'll enjoy it. So just go to universetoday.com slash newsletter and you can sign up. All right, let's get into the questions. Alberto Caravajal. Hey, Fraser, I'm from Costa Rica. I have a question. Why doesn't NASA build a new Hubble Space Telescope based on the design of the existing and update all the components that can be done in less time and less cost? Unless they launch in the year 4000 for James Webb, it can be launched from a Falcon Heavy at low cost. This is a question that comes up a lot, right? Which is the Hubble Space Telescope is the most powerful astronomical instrument that's ever been built. And it has been going for like 30 years now. It's still going to be around for another 10 years at least, depending if they're able to service it again. It's an amazing workhorse and it is oversubscribed. It is, it is filled up all the time. And astronomers could use two Hubbles, three Hubbles. They could probably use 10 Hubble Space Telescopes and still do some amazing science. The problem is that the Hubble Space Telescope is limited. It can only see so far. It can only see with so much clarity and it can only see in the wavelengths that it does. The James Webb is actually seeing in a level of infrared that is very different from what the Hubble Space Telescope does. So even if, if you built another Hubble Space Telescope, it would be an amazing boon for astronomers. They would use it like crazy, but it doesn't give you those wavelengths that James Webb does. James Webb is the next generation. It's going to allow astronomers to look right out to the edge of the observable universe in every direction and see the first galaxies coming together, the first star forming regions as the first building blocks of the universe were assembled. And you just can't get that with the Hubble Space Telescope. If you have 10 Hubbles, it still isn't good enough. You need the bigger, more sensitive, James Webb that's in that wavelength. And this was just a decision that astronomers made. The next big questions that they need answered require a really sensitive infrared telescope like James Webb. And so this is what they put on their wish list, and this is what's been built. Um, so that's why we have it. Jessica, 1993. Regarding panspermia, how did the original life that came from wherever come to exist? Notice how no one ever addresses this point. Well, the question about where does life come from, what was the, I mean, we know that life has evolved from other life and you can trace back the tree of life through all of its, you know, ancestors, all the way back to very simple single celled organisms. But we don't know what got that first organism going. And so this idea of panspermia, that life can move from world to world within the solar system, definitely can push back the formation of life. Well, what do you know? If we find life on Mars and it, and it is related to life on Earth, we have this idea of panspermia, that life could be moving back and forth from world to world. So it makes sense. And maybe even that life could go from solar system to solar system, moving through space on asteroids or whatever. And it still doesn't answer that first question, where did life come from in the first place? It just pushes the question back. At the end of the day, until we can actually, in the lab, replicate the conditions for life, be able to show that you can go from non-life to life, we will never know how life first arose. And this is one of the big mysteries in the universe. And anybody who tells you they know the answer to where life came from doesn't actually know. They're just guessing or they're saying something that somebody told them. Trigger though. What would happen if you opened a jar during a spacewalk and closed it again and then opened it in the ISS or would it implode before that? If you've ever flown in an airplane, you've probably experienced this a bit, right? You have a water bottle that you have at the, uh, the surface of the earth, right? And then you get it in an airplane and you notice that the water bottle has kind of bulged out and inflated. And that's because the gas that is inside the water bottle is at a uh, higher pressure than the air that's outside of it. And so it is expanding. And so the water bottle, and then if you open up the water bottle, the air rushes out and then it equalizes. And then when you land again, the water bottle kind of crunches in because now it's the opposite. And the higher pressure, atmospheric pressure is pushing in the plastic in the water bottle. And so if you went to space 
and did the same experiment, it would happen, but at a more dramatic version of that. So you would, and it all just depends on like, would it implode? It all just depends on the, how strong your bottle is. If you take a, a water bottle, a plastic water bottle, and you have it on the space station and it's filled with air from the space station, and then you go outside, it's going to kind of inflate like a balloon as best it can. And then it'll either cr crack because there's, you know, the plastic can't hold it and it's fragile and brittle, but say that it does and you open it up, then all the air is going to rush right out. And now it's going to have vacuum inside of it, just like the rest of space. And then you close the lid and you bring it back inside the station and it's going to crunch down because all of that atmospheric pressure that's inside the station is going to be pushing on all sides and there's no pressure pushing back out. So, and whether it implodes or whether it explodes or any of those, it just depends on what the stuff is made out of. It's made of titanium as opposed to being made of a balloon. So pretty cool. Gil Kerr, pity party. I followed you since Astronomy Cast episodes one, and yet over time, you have never answered any questions I've asked. I love your channels and I can't afford to be a patron. I wish I could support you. There you go. I answered your question. Um, so, uh, but, and thank you so much for being a subscriber on Astronomy Cast uh, since episode one. That means a lot to me and to Pamela. Uh, we're up to episode 500 and I don't know, 40 or something like that. And we're just about to go into our hiatus. And again, don't worry about being a patron. The whole point about Patreon is that a small number of people who have the money can support the work that we do to be able to make it available and freely available, right? When we as creators have these options, do we put our content behind a paywall so that people can't read it unless they're willing to pay? Do we just fund everything with advertising? That's the solution, but then the advertisers are your customers. And Patreon, I think, is the best model because we get to create this material, we get to release it out into the wide internet so that anybody who wants to learn about space can, and only a small number of people who donate, willingly donate for the content, can help us continue to do our job. So for those of you who are patrons, thank you so much. For those of you who aren't, don't worry about it. The patrons make it so that you get to watch these, and I get to do this for my living. Lucario Davis. I don't know, I agree we are going to have to give up some sky in the future, but it's not the same as having to give up all of the sky. There will be no escape anywhere on Earth to actually see a nice, clean, true night sky. And also, nobody really had any say in it, but everyone will have to live with it. If they could make them much darker, I'd be happy. I mentioned this a, a bit on some of the live streams and other shows. We're coming to this point where we're going to have to make a decision, right? We know that 3 billion more people on Earth are going to want internet. Uh, they're going to need cell phone towers. They're going to need underwater cables that are going to go through marine environments. They're going to go, they're going to be digging uh, trenches to be able to lay down fiber optic cable. To bring more people onto the internet is going to have an impact on the environment. And then the question is, which one do you want to do? Which is the one that minimizes the effect on the environment, minimizes the carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas emissions, minimizes just the eyesores of having gigantic cell phone towers all over the place. And when we get to like, say the 5G, they're smaller towers, but they're going to be everywhere. That's an option. Or more and more of these underwater cables. So it's just like, it's just cost benefit. You've just got to decide of all the possible ways that we are going to ruin our environment to bring people onto the internet. Um, you've got to pick which one you are willing to live with. And I think s satellites that I can barely see and have to remove from my astrophotography is the one that I can live, li live with compared to the other options. And I, like, none of them are great. I get it, right? It sucks. And yet, here we are on the internet. You're watching this video. You're making comments you're, because you have access to the internet. And three billion people want access to. Louis Mamakos. I'm more annoyed at the general level of light pollution than orbiting point sources of light. If we want to preserve the night sky, the real benefit is from reducing the light needlessly directed upwards and scattering. I can process out satellite trails between taking multiple images. I can't as easily process out the shot noise associated with sky brightness due to light pollution. Hey Lewis, it's great to hear from you. Uh, for people who don't know, Lewis is an amazing astrophotographer, one of the people who used to join us on the virtual star parties. And, and I think you're right, that, that if you're worried about losing the night sky, light pollution is the absolute number one culprit. We have lost the night sky. It is gone for large portions of, of populated areas. You can't go to any place 
on the eastern seaboard from like, I don't know, the middle of the United States to the east that you don't have a tremendous amount of light pollution. There's these tiny little spots of dark skies. Now other places like here in Canada and Australia, they still have dark skies, but but I guarantee you could ask any astronomer and they would take a thousand times worse satellite trails than our current state of light pollution. It is awful. And if there's one wish that I could have is that we could somehow reduce that light pollution that's going on around the earth. That is the thing that has stolen the night sky from so many of us. Michael Tadia. The satellites don't need to fly so low that we see them. That's the solution. Less satellites, higher up. All of us don't want to see 10,000 satellites lighting up the evening sky and you don't need thousands of satellites. We don't know what the final configuration of satellite-based high-speed internet anywhere across the planet is going to look like. I'm, I'm hearing now that in fact the Starlink isn't going to be able to really provide good satellite coverage in cities. It's going to be more for the people in the rural areas, places that have no internet now at all. They're the ones that are going to be able to get the bandwidth. It might be that, that having satellites fly really low is the way to get more uh, internet access and by having them actually fly low then they're in the shadow of the earth and you probably won't even see them. If you fly them higher then they remain in sunlight for longer and they're easier to see. The reality is that we just don't know. More studies needed, more time spent figuring out what is that best balance between light pollution, between you know putting streaks in the night sky and giving internet access to people around the world who don't have access right now and that is the balance that we have to figure out. Keith in ADHD. Have there been any confirmations of a star without planets? The problem is, is that finding planets around a star is really, really, really hard to do. So all we can do is confirm that there are planets around a star. I mean, if you find some star that is orbiting and we can't detect any planets, that just means that we haven't been able to detect them yet. And maybe in the future, as we get better techniques, we'll be able to find planets around them. And maybe someday when we finally are able to send a spacecraft to a, another star and do a really comprehensive search, we can finally rule out any planets around that, around that star. But until then, all we can know is that there are stars that we haven't discovered planets yet. Go green. Is it worth getting an MS or PhD in astrophysics or one is perfectly able to learn a kin level of substance for books, talks, astro shows, crash courses, and professor lectures on the web? And your show, of course, Mr. Kane. It all depends on what you want to get out of it. If you want to be a working astronomer who works for a research institution or works at a using b the big telescopes around the world, you're going to need your PhD. It's just, it's like your table stakes. It's, what you, it's your entrance through the door. Once you, uh, once you have done that, then you can be a researching astronomer, have your papers published in the journals, etc. If you don't want to go that route, if you, if you want to continue with your regular day job, then I think it's perfectly fine to learn as much as you want in all of the ways that you that are available, as you mentioned, books and courses and lectures and all kinds of stuff. And it is better now than has ever been in human history that you can follow your curiosity and your interests as far as you want. And then as soon as you've decided you've had enough of it, you can move on to something else. The other cool thing is there's a lot of citizen science projects that you can get involved in. So even if you're not willing to spend the 11 years to get your PhD, and I don't blame you, it's expensive, there's not a lot of jobs. Um, like with what we do with CosmoQuest, right now you can go to bennu.cosmoquest.org and you can help us map out the surface of asteroid Bennu so that OSIRIS-REx can find a safe landing spot. You're doing real science. This is material, this is information that the scientists are going to use. You are participating in this and as you learn more, more you can work on more specialized citizen science projects. And, and that's sort of one of the things that we've done with CosmoQuest that I'm really excited about is to just try to, to bridge this connection for people who are really enthusiastic about space and astronomy, but they're busy. They've got a career. They don't have the time or resources to drop everything for another 11 years to get their PhD. And that's what it's for, is people like you. So come, Come to CosmoQuest, help us map Bennu, and uh, find a safe landing spot for OSIRIS-REx. Richard's Workshop. Since Alphabet owns an interest in SpaceX, you can invest in it indirectly if you buy or own Alphabet stock. Alphabet owns 7.5 of SpaceX, and Alphabet has around 747 million shares outstanding as of this posting. Therefore, 
For each share of Alphabet that one owns or buys, they have approximately a 1 10 billionth indirect interest in SpaceX. Nice hack. Yeah, so Alphabet, which is Google's parent company, did an investment in SpaceX a long time ago, and they own 7.5%. So if you want to buy shares of Google Alphabet, that will give you ownership in SpaceX. So that is the way to... And I guess if you bought all of Alphabet, then you would own 7.5% of SpaceX. So nice. Richard Hayes. I'm listening to the podcast that you did with Space Junk. Do you really get death threats or did I misunderstand? Yeah, I get death threats. Uh, it's, it's a pretty common thing. Anyone in the science communication field, um, so space sciences, astronomy, climate science, environmentalism, all kinds of things, you get death threats. Uh, some of them are, I think, religiously motivated. So the things that we're saying about the nature of the universe conflicts with the things people have been taught by their religion, and they think that the appropriate response is to threaten someone's life. Um, uh, other times, there's sort of all of these conspiracy theories that are going around, like with the moon landing conspiracies and the Flat Earth Society, and they get so worked up that they think that the right response is to threaten someone's life. Um, I would say it's happened a dozen times to me. A few have been serious enough that I, you know, I've been a little weirded out. There's been some occasional people who have been uh, investigated and in some cases taken to jail for making death threats online. Uh, it sucks. That is just one of the things that you have to do. I just want to talk about space and, and people want me to die. Um, that's, that's sort of the internet. And it shows you that whenever you're like being a troll and you're just like, I don't know, lashing out at someone who you don't even know who's on the other side of a video screen and is making a video, you are just noticeably, noticeably imperceptibly making their life a little worse. So... That's the price of, of being a troll. Obviously, I let it all kind of slide off of me. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm dead inside. But, you know, for a lot of the younger people who, who start out, and a lot of their sort of self-worth and confidence is built, built into what they're doing, it's pretty disheartening to have that kind of stuff sent to them. And I feel pretty bad for a lot of the horrible stuff that people receive. But not you! watching this. You're awesome. Thank you so much for your support and, and being uh, polite and positive as you watch these videos and other videos on the internet. E. Loesch. I may have missed this episode. Is it possible for a solar system complete with planets in the habitable zone to exist independent of a galaxy? Maybe the, the presence of planets all comes down to the metallicity. And this metal is the term that astronomers use to define anything that is heavier than helium. So lithium, sodium, iron, it's all just metal. Oxygen, metal. And these heavier elements are formed in either nucleosynthesis in the hearts of stars, especially stars that are exploding supernova, and they seed these heavier materials into the surrounding gas. And so you've got some leftover hydrogen and helium that's left over right from the Big Bang, and it collapses down, but it's been seeded with all these heavier elements, and that's what creates, you know, trees and oxygen that you can breathe and things like that. And so if the if a star wasn't in a galaxy, then it probably didn't get a lot of these events that would have seeded its original star forming nebula to give it these heavier elements. And so the thought is that you won't see a lot. At the same time, astronomers are finding planets are finding high amounts of metallicity in stars that are more and more surprising. They're, they found planets around very low metallicity stars, which is showing that what we assume about the universe isn't always true. So it may very well be that you could have the right situation for a star system to be out in the gulf between galaxies. It still had enough supernova, seed it with material, and it was able to create planets. All right. That is the end of this week's episode. Those are all your questions. As always, I really appreciate it. If a question pops in your brain, take a second, write it down in any video. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, we'll see you next week.